This is cheaper, faster. And the question that she asked me. chunk of change. So yes, it's supposed to be about the future of IT. We want to know what you guys think about um, where you think it's going to go, and what the deal, how that's going to affect you guys as well, and um, you know what kind of insights we can give you on, on that front. Um, I think we're all pretty much on the same page uh, that IT, from a delivery standpoint, is going to change drastically in the next five to ten years, and I think it's going to affect all of us in, in, in our careers. So. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree. It's, it's um, it, the small business, especially, and, and I guess some of the stuff's gonna. When you can come out line next, I haven't. Yeah, it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna play right into the next cut, into the next speech on commodity line because um, while I think you present last presented this in like 2014. 2014. Yeah. Um, it, the the it's it's valid, and I've seen it shift since 2014 when Scott last talked about the commodity line. You know, everything, as, as I insinuated in voice, you're buying it as a service. When you start to be able to buy the service commodity, um, and, and it's just the way things go. And like right now, you guys want to go buy new servers, you know. Great, you, you spec it out, you get very detailed because you have very specific needs for that. But what about your desktops? Do you actually care? You need a, you need a desktop with a eh, four or eight gigs of RAM. You don't even care about the processor. You know, um, and it just has to have a Windows 10 SKU for now, or hey, Fedora and what our Linux or whatever when you're going forward. But you don't care about it, do you? And, and, and you image it, and you and it's out there. Um, but that's what you do now. You, Ten years ago, people were still putting them together because it was way more cost effective for the general person. Yeah, for the specialist now, which you know, it's still depending on how you're doing things, it could still be you know cost, more cost effective. But for the general, the people, it's. Your computer's a commodity now. You, you grab one from Dell, whatever's in stock, have it shipped out from your VAR, um, and then you throw it on the desk after you image it, and when it blows up in six months or five years, you just simply replace it. You don't troubleshoot, you don't care, because it's become a commodity, and, and everything changes, so the skill, but because of that, that affected the skills that you guys need. So your skills now are different. You know, I, I cannot tell you how many people I've replaced over the years, even before I was a consultant, just as I got new jobs, um, who I replaced because they never learned anything else. All they knew how to do was what they learned in the 90s and how to build a whole computer and then stick it on somebody's desk. And they couldn't handle the fact that you don't do that anymore. And this, you know, looking at 2005, six ish, you just go buy a new computer and put it on their desk. You don't put one together. So that's how things changed in the past. And it's gonna, the, the next five to 10 years are gonna be no different except the piece that's changing is the next piece. It's gonna be your email servers. It's gonna be your servers, you know, um, things like that. Yeah, you know, I think, I think Jared's right. And I think one of the areas that we see impacted a lot that we don't normally talk about is bench services, right? Uh, in, the, in the 1990s, bench services was a huge, um, not part of IT, well, to some people Bench is a subset of IT, or if you see Bench as just a side career to IT, but in the Bench world where people are putting computers on desks, assembling computers, looking at parts, dealing with ports, right? How long ago was it that we were like, oh, I gotta know how this port works and what adapter works with that port and blah, and that was like a huge thing, and we like dealt with this every day. I don't know when the last time is I worried about what port something had. Right? I don't look at what ports come on devices that I buy. I don't, I don't worry about compatibility. Like That stuff doesn't happen. I'm just, you get a computer, you plug it in. Does it support it? There's no hardware. I don't have specialized hardware for anything. None of my customers do. I mean, somebody must, but it's so rare. Everything's just over the network. And right, you just, as an ethernet jack, it may not even have that. It's wireless, whatever. Uh, and that entire field of, of bench, specifically has been much more impacted than, than we are on the IT side. And it used to be that we had to have this huge amount of local hands for everything, whether it was us or whether it was someone else, and you know, somebody was going to customers and constantly touching things. And today we still have bench and we still have the need to touch things, but it's mostly doing things that are either really simple, such as lifting a computer onto the desk because no one else wants to lift it, 
uh, which is arguably just a facilities role that someone in bench is doing for the facilities person who isn't there, because no one hires that person. Uh, or it's something much more complex, like they're actually troubleshooting a local networking problem, and we can't get IT online remotely to work on whatever it is because of an actual networking issue. But pretty much everything else is gone. The bench people really need to focus on customer service in a way that they haven't previously because if they're not interacting with a the person, they probably have very little to do. But if they are interacting with the person, there's a lot of opportunity for like, did you know if you turn your monitor, it doesn't glare so much? Or, you know, if you disinfect your desk, sometimes you won't be sick all the time, right? Those, kind of, and those things are very silly, well, and but they're, they're real. In customer service, if you think about what our job is, you know, IT for years and years has had a bad rep as, you know, the IT guy, you know, they sit him in a corner in the back of a room and then, you know, turn all the lights out and, you know, he plays video games, you know, all through the night and probably never leaves the building. Well, that's not really true. Uh, and we have to understand that, yeah, well, he is, but <laughs> we have to understand that, that our users are our customers. And so we have to provide some modicum of, of customer support and customer service. Um, and we'll talk about some of that when we get to uh, IT finance and the fact that you can save yourself a lot of headache by pushing a lot of your finance to your customers. And they're your customers, so they should be paying for their stuff. And once you realize that they're a customer, it becomes much easier to service them. Um, and you know they're just making a request as a customer. Sometimes you know customers are not very smart. Um, sometimes they don't know really what they want. Uh, but that's our job as IT professionals to be able to provide that. Right. And and, and just as a stress point, because and, you know because most of you know so customer doesn't mean customer. It just means who you're doing the work for. So your internal IT, your customers are your users. And as long as you think about it and organize it that way, the, the, the same principles apply. So don't get hung up on a term, you know, that, that gets said because the principles apply across the board. And and how you do that and how things are gonna, you know, you work on it, it gets in again. This gets into my talk tomorrow. I don't know. How, I don't know how a lot of integrated talk. We did integrated talk. We did. Well, this wasn't planned either. Um, That's why we don't plan. Because naturally, we just the, 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 the pertinent topics, I guess. But you, you have, you know, your role in IT, uh, you know, is, is going forward the way I see it. It's definitely a customer-focused role in, in 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 that point of view. You know, for me, they're clients. You know, if you're because you know, I'm external to them all. Um, for you, it's the CEO, um, and for you, it's the users, um, and for Nick, it's the management, you know, that kind of thing. It depends on who your users are, who your customer is, but the big thing I see changing, you know, go, as things come forward, is that we, as IT, have lost all of the bench, you know, because mm -hmm. you know while, while Scott likes to always separate the words and say them all separately, we all know it's actually just a different hat that we've right. worn, and you know, so you know he's the bench guy now, you know, um, but IT has always worn all these different hats. Sometimes for the bench, sometimes for actual IT, sometimes for customer service, you know, because and sometimes that's, we're developers, and sometimes we're developers. Um, so as things go forward where I see a lot of this coming is the IT role is really going to be a lot more customer service focused from the point of view of you have to know what the IT services are, you organize the services, you manage the services as an IT manager as was mentioned in one of the earlier talks and then you're a customer service rep to whoever you're helping work on the suit with. So you're interfacing you know the technology, but you're interfacing as a customer service rep to the CEO or to the users or to the interns or to the whoever. Um, and that's kind of as, I, as things move forward, that's what right. I see. And, and, and you yeah. become an IT customer liaison. Mm -hmm. And you're an IT customer liaison for the CEO, anyone else knows the numbers, and you're a liaison for the user when he has a problem and you have to bring in a vendor to fix it, whether that's ERP or, or what that might be. It may be your you know, PBX provider. It might you know you don't know what that is, but uh, like I said, you're going to have to either become very specialized in a certain field and kind of dive into that, or you're going to have to become more of a services management, IT services management expert. One of my articles a couple of years ago was all IT is external, 
right? To your end users, uh, whether you're an MSP or you're just the IT department, they actually see us all the same. We're an external group to the users, partially because IT is just those weird people out there that they, we don't know what they do for a job. We don't know what they do in their spare time. Like they're very confused about us, but we're always external to them because we're not operations. We're not the business. And in much the same way, human resources is also always external to everyone else in the business, right? Well, they're HR, like they're not part of us, right? And it's just how things work. Legal teams the same way. So it's not unique to IT, but as a non-operations department and as not the executive management, which they're kind of in a chain, IT is always external. And we can reverse that and say all IT has customers, whether you're internal or external. So it goes both ways. Um, Oh, great. I had something wonderful I was going to say, and now I don't remember what it was. Um, to continue on something that you had said. But, oh, 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 as in everyone is customer service. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I really like to get across when talking to customers is uh, partially because, and just users, right? Users have a tendency to see IT as the naysayers, right? They read Dilbert and they know, ha the IT naysayer is here to stop me doing what I want to do. And it's true, IT sometimes has to do that because users sometimes want to do ridiculous things, right? It's the parents and children. We're not here to say no to everything, but we are here to say no to touching hot things on the stove, right? And so sometimes we do have to say no, and that's just, that's our job is to kind of have this oversight into the rest of the company. So yes, sometimes we have to say no, but in general, one of the things I like to do when we have, especially new users who aren't used to us, is sit down and explain, we are customer service. One, we only define our value by how much more valuable we can make you, right? We don't carry value on our own. Hopefully we're a very valuable department, but we only create value by either saving the company money or making it more efficient. We can kind of save it money without users being involved, but we certainly can't make it more efficient without customers being involved. And so we should be seen as a business enabler to our customers. If you're asking us for good things, we should be coming back with good answers, right? We need more efficient email. We're gonna find a way to get you more efficient email. We need to save costs. We're gonna find ways to save costs. I need to be able to do this job better. Okay, let's sit down and do that, right? We can, and part of it is teaching our users not to come to us with the answer. Right? They may have the answer. Sometimes they know exactly what they need. But in general, they need to come to us with problems. If they think they have the answer, maybe come to us with a goal and then propose the answer. And we can say maybe that is and maybe that isn't the answer. But your goal is something we can probably agree on. Right? Most users are going to have a, a, a reasonable goal. Teach them to say it. Right? Make them understand that. Think at the goal level as a user. I'm wasting five hours every week doing this task. There must be an easier way. I have some thoughts on that, right? Great, let's sit down and let's see if we can save you five hours a week. Saving you five hours a week really makes me valuable as the person that helps make you valuable. And, right? and, and that's so true. In the last company I worked for, they had a guy who was a scheduler. And his job consisted of approximately two and a half days a week of making the six same clicks in the ERP system. <laughs> Literally the same six clicks two and a half days a week. That was his entire job uh, for that part of that task. And the thing was, is that we had tried to create a culture of having people bring their problems to IT and we'll find solutions. This actually came up in the smoking area. He was out there and he was bitching about this. I said, Chris, why haven't you ever said anything about this before? Well, that's just the way the ERP works. Yeah, but we can change that. <laughs> So now that actually, we, we reduced his time on that to about 20 minutes one day a week. Because we automated it. And that's the kind of things that IT can do from a customer service standpoint if you understand the users. And if the users understand that they can come to you with their day-to-day -day issues and we will attempt to find you solutions. Sometimes we can. No, I'm sorry, you're stuck making six clicks two and a half days a week. Um, so. As customer service people, that's our job, is to go out there and help our users to do a better job because at the end of the day, even if you're working for a company, your users are your customers. They're the ones who are actually paying your paycheck. They're the ones who can actually get you fired. <laughs>
because if there's enough complaints from the user community about you or your services, they're going to find somebody else to do it. And so, yeah. yeah. And that's how shadow IT happens, right? Oh. If we're not there to do what needs to be done, they're going to start working around you. And if they work around you and it works, then management is going to start seeing them as doing your job, right? Oh, well, IT said this couldn't be done, but sales got it done. Therefore, sales knows IT better than IT does. Man, that's how management's gonna see it. And you know what? If that's true, management's probably right. So having that, that interaction of, of making sure we're actually looking for good answers, that we want to enable the business, really goes a long way. And uh, we have, Paul and I were in <clears throat> Norcross, <laughs> having a good conversation, and uh, we sat down with a team that had never had discrete IT and development before. They always saw them as a single team. And because they had always come through development, development's not a customer service department. Right, development's job is to create products, they're engineers. Right? They don't have a mindset, they don't have a goal, they don't have a deliverable of customer service. But they had always had to come through customer service to get to their IT people. And because of that, development had this kind of gateway of like, no, we don't do that. No, we don't want to talk about that. And we sat down and we're like, no, 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 just call us, discuss stuff. Don't be afraid to come through us. There's no, there's no development in between us anymore. Just let us know where your pain points are. And they were like, oh my gosh, we never, like they, it was a big surprise. They didn't know what to do, and uh, a lot of it was just having the, the the political position to be able to move into a spot and say, come directly through to our customer service department, and just just hit us up for things. And yeah, we can't always say yes, but we're always going to sit down and have that conversation and be reasonable and and look into it. Maybe we can fix things. Maybe it's what you think. Maybe it's not. But that's what we're here for. And uh, just knowing to have that conversation, right, can be a huge thing. Right. And then the same thing applies, you know, as you're looking for, you know, where, where is your position going to go? What are you going to be doing? And yeah, I mean, everything's moving more cloud as, as you know, the, the email thread in the community mentioned and we talked about it in earlier discussion, you know, uh, figure out where that's going to go. I know where I'd like it to go. I'd like it to go to Office 365 because I know, I know that that's going to work with their um, ERP system and something else that they've got coming down the line. The customer doesn't want to do it because they just see that recurring revenue. Well, how do you work with that? Well, you know, I got to talk to the CEO and I've got to talk to the controller in the accounting department and make them understand that that new OPEX charge is actually going to be better in the long run and, and understand how that's going to work because it's going to interface with their other systems. And so by working them towards a new future of this new services, what did I just say? I just said the same thing they did. It's customer service. We, I have to know the, I have to know the technology. So you know, we we keep talking about customer service and things like that. And that, you know, don't freak out. You're not going to become a customer service rep, like you think of customer service reps. But you are customer service for IT. So you still have to know the products. You're still going to have to know the solutions. But you're going to be, you know, that part of it is, is you know, is going to be dealing with that. But then the other part of it is, and I definitely think, is you're going to become that manager of all of them. You're going to be managing um, your Office 365 subscription, and you're going to be managing your um, cloud subscriptions for your other you know, Azure services and this and that. And you're going to become the person that manages all that, so you have to know about those. And you still have to know about the technologies that, run, that are running on them. But you're no longer running those technologies specifically, because that Azure service you spun up is something that you bought from a vendor. And the vendor has to support that. You just have to make sure the services are there and that the, at the inst and everything was installed and set up right. And then when things fail or have an issue, you work with the vendor of whatever product that is and get it back up and running. So you're not the technician anymore because honestly, IT never was, but that's Again, the whole thing about mini hats, IT, especially in the small business, was everything. And it simply isn't going to exist anymore. Or the everything is going to change. The everything is going to be managing the everything. You're not going to be the guy touching the everything. You're simply managing it, okay? So you've got all these servers on Vulture, you've got these servers on AWS, you've got this Office 365 subscription, all these things. You don't know what they all do in detail, you just know that these are needed for the ERP, this one's needed for that, and you know which vendors you work with for each solution. Um, so as 
IT drives forward, that's where I see things happening. And there's definitely going to be in the in the near term, it, it, definitely in the next five years, because of, just because of hardware cycles, new hardware is going to get purchased, new servers going to get purchased. But the things are going to be running on it, all virtualized, all workloads. So the same thought process still applies, even if it's on your local system. If you're thinking about it in the way of services, um, you're going to spin up a new um, ERP system from Epicor, Profit 21, or whatever. I love that solution so much, I just wanted to throw it out. Anyways. Uh, um, <laughs> Is there any ERP that anybody likes? Is, it, is there any ERP on the market that anybody likes? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, okay. you're going to just deal with the ERP VM. You're going to be the person that maybe set it up still in the near term. But you don't actually do any work on it. You don't do it now. And in the future, it's just going to be hosted on Azure or AWS or wherever. And you're still not going to do any work on it. Just the position where it is is maintained. You're not going to have a local server. You know, so things are already moving that way, you know, but definitely getting, is still moving, you know, in the, in the smaller business especially, very slowly. It's just, there's nothing else makes financial sense, and businesses run on finances. You know, I think that's been said a number of times well, so yeah. far today. <laughs> well, and, 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 the, and the market is getting more and more competitive, and it's getting more and more competitive because there's not siloed, uh, distribution, there's not siloed information any, anymore. Right. You know, information is worldwide. And, you know, if you think about it, how many people in here uh, believe that their hardware vendor is making money on the hardware? Okay. There's nobody making any money on hardware. For some reason, there's, some somebody is making money somewhere, but as a reseller of hardware, there's no money in it. And the problem is, is that it becomes a bad customer service uh, uh, stance when you have to sell your customer a part at a premium price because you're trying to make a profit margin out of that, whether it's a hard drive or whatever it is. Because the minute he finds out that what you charged him for that hard drive and what he can go buy it for on the internet, he doesn't want you anymore. And so that's, you know, that's the the availability of information is changing the landscape in the way that businesses look at IT. Uh, it's not that they have to rely, it's, and it's the same thing that Jared was talking about, the old phone, phone company approach. You know, you had to have all three pieces and the phone company knew that, and so they gave you all three as a package of one great low price. It wasn't really a low price at all. Uh, and when you start parsing that information out, you find out that you're overpaying for a lot of stuff. And that's what companies, as the markets become more competitive, companies are looking for places they can save money. How many people have had their finance department or their CEO come to them and say, hey, I need you to reduce your budget by 20%? Okay, that's gonna happen in any large organization. It's a stupid way for them to come and reduce money, but it's easy for them to do that. What they don't understand is that that's not how IT works. And so like I said, when we talk about IT finance tomorrow, I'll show you ways to combat those kind of problems where they don't come at you and say, we need to reduce your budget by 20%. But we'll talk about that. So I think, you know, one of the things is we just said, you know, IT is moving away from what I like to call button pushing, right? We're not the techs doing these really repetitive, non-specialist tasks so much anymore. We still do them, but they're getting less and less. And one of the areas that we're moving more into, and it's not so much that we didn't have it before, but it's that we didn't have the time to do it before, and it wasn't the spot where our field was being competitive before, is customer service. And we're also touching on, I haven't really said it, so one of the other places that we're becoming financial specialists, right? IT has a tendency, especially in the small business, to have more financial acumen than the CFO. Just saying tends to, certainly there's lots of very qualified CFOs out there with loads of accounting and business training who know exactly what they're doing and look at the world from a very financial perspective. But the average SMB CFO, just like the average SMB CEO, earns less than the average systems administrator. Think about that for a second. The average industry systems administrator is higher compensated than the average CEO in the SMB. There's I mean, reason for I mean more than, than the controller of the company. She didn't know that, but I did. Well, actually, she probably did know that. <laughs> she probably figured it out. She probably figured so, it out. But these are, 
but, but so these are, are real numbers that tell us something. One, it tells us that there's a lot more CEOs in the SMB than there are systems administrators, right? That's actually a big factor as to why that's true. But CEOs and CFOs in the SMB typically are not trained. They are often people who either had an idea, came up with some money, decided to take a risk, or had a family or friend who was willing to invest in them, not people who earned the position through a career ladder where they started off you know, mentored or were educated in the field, worked up as a specialist. The average CEO, certainly there are specialist CEOs in, um, in the field. And for those of you who know Chad Oliver in the community, his father is an SMB specialist CEO. 50 years of experience from company to company as a CEO, gets paid huge amounts of money because he has who knows how many degrees and specifically that, that's a specialty. That's really rare. It's amazing when you find one, you're like, oh my gosh, an actual CEO. They're great to work for because they know what they're doing and you can simply present them with, here's my value, and they go, great, value, moving on, right? But the average CEO works on emotion. They've never, they have no training in business, they have no idea how things work. They may want to do a good job, they may do a good job, but they're struggling to do it because they don't have the background and training. In IT, we traditionally have a lot of training compared to either of those positions in the SMB. So it's a really easy thing for us to be put into a position where we actually have more insight or experience or just capability within the financial space. We may have to step up and bring that as, as part of our package right, to the business. And that's a place where we differentiate very heavily. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to take the place of the CFO, but it means we may be in a position where we're going to the CFO with all the information saying, okay, walk with me to the CEO and repeat what I say, right? We need to empower them to make those decisions and even a pretty unqualified CEO or CFO when presented with actual math, unless they are absolutely incompetent, is going to be ready and excited to have you bringing that to the table. Now, if they're completely incompetent or it's a hobby business, separate discussion, and a lot of small businesses are hobbies, they have no interest in making money. This is the problem with hobby businesses, right? They are actually businesses whose purpose is emotional satisf satisfaction. They don't qualify for fiduciary responsibility. There are many legal forms in which you are allowed to have a non-fiduciary responsibility organization, so there's nothing illegal about that. Hobby businesses are a very real thing for people who just want to spend their money owning a business. You, you can't make them happy with logic. It's just the nature of the thing. But so, okay, so customer service, finance, vendor relationship, which Jared touched on, there's an unbelievable amount, there's always been a lot, but our value where we differentiate ourselves from other IT professionals and from other IT departments is heavily more today than it has been in the past, interfacing with vendors, whether that's vendor selection, vendor management, reining them in, filtering them out from, you know, talking to the business uh, and getting, you know, the last thing you want is some bad vendor or even a decent vendor who's just really talkative getting to the CEO and wasting valuable CEO resources when they didn't need to be, right? I'm reining in the CEO when he sees that Barracuda sign at the airport. That's a separate issue, but yes, yes. big one. Yes. Um, but so vendor management is a spot where dealing with Microsoft, dealing with Google, dealing with these big vendors, and simply being the interface to them, whether you're the one making the accounts, whether you're the one uh, arguing about prices, whether you're the one picking the levels or the features, all those things are things that require financial knowledge, customer service knowledge, technical knowledge, and knowledge of the business and how it operates, right? Even though the users may say they want certain features, you may know other features are better for them or that they won't really use it or it's too expensive or whatever. And then the last piece that I think is the other hat that IT really needs to wear to bring the new value in the future is um, uh, purchasing management, right? And this is one that we should have been doing all along. And either our businesses don't trust us to, or it's something we tend to overlook because it's just, it's not a big deal, right? But companies buy a lot of stuff and good purchasing controls. Now, some of you may be in a business big enough to have a purchasing department that you can hand this off to, in which case you're off the hook. Most of us don't have that, right? So one of the things that I deal with every day for lots of my customers, right? We handle their purchasing management. We have the purchasing relationships. Of course, this overlaps with vendor management, but we have purchasing relationships. We have their credit cards. We have their addresses. We have all that stuff, and we handle selecting products, getting a good price, making sure the parts match, making sure it's the thing that they intended to get. Often the thing they intended to get is something we help them decide. They may not even, they may not even know what it is they need to get, right? We may be 
doing every piece. We may do everything and then hand it off to them to approve for the credit card or whatever, but we can bring a lot of value to getting them a good price, making sure that the vendor relationship is in place, having it shipped to the right place. And there's really no one else to do it, even though it's technically a purchasing, not an IT thing. It's a spot where really IT is the only department with the, the capacity to do it well. And I think so those four things I think are kind of, they all seem kind of ancillary, but if you really view IT as being a business discipline, not a technical discipline like Bench, yes, we touch tech, yes, we have to be very technical, yes, we have to know how the things work. It's not that we're not technical, but the core of what makes us IT is that we are business. We understand the business, we represent the business, we defend the business, we are the first line and the last line of defense between the outside world and our businesses outside of the actual operations department. Those things are all things we don't think about. Finance and customer service and purchasing and vendors, relationship management, but they are all things that no one else can do and they are part of IT because we are a business function, we are business infrastructure. And, and, to, and to, to, to jump board off of that, we're also the solutions providers. We're the ones that can provide the solutions. And if we provide that role of customer service, and that's where we bring value to the business of being able to bring solutions for either short-term or long-standing problems that nobody's ever looked at from an IT perspective. You know, things like, Someone clicking six times the same place, two and a half days a week. You know that that's the kind of things that, that IT can come in and help resolve. Uh, one of the solutions we provided for a manufacturer was uh, essentially a paperless shop floor manufacturing system, and they went from printing about thirty to thirty-five thousand pieces of paper a month down to less than a thousand pieces of paper a month. Well, you don't think that's a lot, but when you add up those numbers, they're huge. They're off the scale of huge. Uh, and you know things like that, waste management. You know we can see things in IT that sometimes they don't see even in finance, and that's you know wasted product on the shop floor because we see it. We see it through the database. We see it through uh, the usage. We see it through doing that random bench check out on the floor of a computer not working. Yep. So, and and that's uh, you know part of what IT is. IT is all parts of the business. We interface everywhere because technology is in all parts of the business because technology is business. You know, whether or not the business knows it, you know, that's, you know, a business cannot exist in the modern world without technology. And so your jobs will always be there. It's just simply a matter of what your job entails and, and we're, you know, we're illuminating different things of you know, we see it on the shop floor when, when we handle it or somebody approached us and say hey you know we're tired of taking all these phone calls for random things that are th the same thing over and over and over again from different customers okay well let's see what would we do oh hey your website looks like crap why can't we put this information on your website and so then we got a solution and found a solution for a company and they put it together and they implemented it and it took a year before people actually started hitting the website more, but suddenly their call volume isn't half of what it was a year ago. You know, so now their, their inside sales reps are spending more time on the phone with their actual customers getting pr productive stuff done. And oh, by the way, now those inside sales reps also know that, hey, if I take, I feel like I'm taking a lot of calls about this, we go, hey, why don't we get that implemented in the website and bring it back over to the web developer? That I didn't do all the work, IT didn't do it, but I organized it and I helped it. And it's just the changing role of where I see IT going. And I think one of the important things is it's not so much that IT hasn't always encompassed these things. It's not that these aren't values that we had in the past. It's that we've been so tied up doing button pushes that we just had to do because there no one else could do them, right? They're, they're too secure and, and only we had the access or it was too technical and only we knew how to do it. We were the department who did these things. Now that we're able to get away from those things more and more as time moves on, we're starting to be able to show even more value in leveraging these more holistic business aspects. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, Jared is trying to say here is 
when you're when you're looking at a business, if you look at the executive suite, the C suite, right? Technically, they have a role in the entire business. It's their business, right? That's their job. They're overseeing everything, but they're busy with executive stuff. They're busy with management and sales and the things that are required to drive the business from a business head perspective. So it's very, very difficult for them to come down into a lot of the other pieces of the business. And every other piece of the business, whether it's operations, HR, legal, finance, you name it, they all have their own roles to do, which are very siloed, and they generally don't know or care or have a reason or authority to interact with other departments. HR really can't walk into legal and be like, hey, what's going on? Tell me about your day, right? It's not their thing. Maybe around the water cooler, but they're not gonna take over their department. And the last thing you want is finance poking around in HR, being like, oh, we're getting all in your business. And it's not really appropriate. But IT both has a mandate for support and customer service to be in all those places, but also an opportunity. We are the one department within the entire organization, short of like janitorial staff, who actually has a reason and purpose and mandate to walk up to every employee and be like, how's your day going? What What's working for you? What's not working for you? How can we make your life better? Show me what you're doing, right? We're unique. We are the, the only normal holistic business department. And so without us, there's really nobody to look at everybody else and say, you know what, HR is having this problem. Finance is having this problem. Human resources is having this problem. Operations, that, you know what? We're missing an ERP that ties all these people together. Let's start figuring out how much money can be saved in the big picture, because everyone else is looking at their silos. And they may have a great view of their silos, but they may have no idea. They're unlikely to have any idea of how that's going to really function to another department. And so if we're not doing it, who's going to? Well, and we also have to be the gatekeeper because of that, that metric of, of silo departments. Your county department may have a lot more, uh, you know, a lot different IT demands than the HR department, and they may not be compatible. So we have to be that gatekeeper saying, hey, wait a minute, HR wants to do this, and you want to do this. I think we need to sit you guys down and talk, come up to a, a solution. So now you end up being a counselor too. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, our roles, uh, they're changing drastically uh, in what we do. And, and it's not that, like Scott said, it's not something that we haven't always been doing. It's just that now our focus has changed a lot more to that side of the fence versus, oh, I've got patches to install this weekend. Or, you know, I have to do this reconfiguration of this firewall this weekend. Um, you know, that's the stuff that's going to go away. Um, and and, and it's, it's probably good that it should. I mean, it needs to evolve. We don't use typewriters anymore. Um, for the, the whole steno pool has gone away. Yeah, the whole steno pool has gone away. They don't even teach typing in school anymore. They teach keyboarding, and it's usually taught in elementary school. So, you know, things change. They don't teach anymore. It's been a well, while. They, teach they, they just give them Chromebooks and let them go. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. They don't even teach them keyboarding anymore? No. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so you see <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm old, man. I'm old. Baby boomer? <laughs> Gen Xers. <laughs> Maybe Boomer. <laughs> yeah, they give them the Google because they're getting all the kids on the Google platform. Mm -hmm. uh, just like very, Apple did. Early on and just yeah. like just like Apple did uh, the third 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So 20th of <laughs> What's that? I'm gonna I'm gonna oh, currently. I'm gonna open this up for uh, questions and let you guys ask your question. Ask us a question. What you, what you got. Uh, or, or just give us your opinion. You can tell us that we're full of it and that we don't know what we're talking so, about. So we'll look at the idea of us moving more toward not necessarily more toward, but we're much more customer service uh -huh. now, right? And, and if you have your managed services, the idea of our systems administrator is is now is that now becoming what what would be what would be now specialties within. Well, I'll take this because uh, more than anyone, I'm, I'm the system admin. Um, systems administration has always been a specialty, even going back um, to the early formations of IT. So, so IT pretty much became a solidified field around, and some of this is my perspective, but around 1992, right? Prior to that, it was really systems operators, developers. We didn't have a discipline of IT. Obviously, the work got done, uh, but it was, it was not a discipline. And that's partially why we see currently a lot of shift is because the field as a discrete discipline is so young. 
Um, so we're still in that, for, you know, the, the, the world is coagulating around us as it takes shape. Um, but systems administration and network administration uh, were, were two of the really primary fields in those early days that were like, well, we know we need this, we know we need this. And then shortly thereafter, like, we need someone to like talk to customers because these people can't, right? So they've been around as specialties, um, but I do think that, you know, we've had uh, a certain amount of the, the, the systems administrator hack has been something that everybody has passed around because it's the one thing that's like, well, there's really no situation where we don't need a systems administrator this part of the time. Network administrator, you could get by for the last, even, even in the 1999, you were still in that like, oh, smaller business, we could just not have a systems administrator role ever. Not even the hack, like we just gotta plug something in and go for it, right? So smaller businesses were able to, to skip that, but systems administration has always been there even if it wasn't the main focus of your role. Uh, but definitely like the overall percentage of time that's being spent on that is rapidly diminishing. Um, and even as a systems administrator, uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing, right? Because it's not a spot where we're delivering a huge amount of value, um, especially now, right? 20 years ago, we could really come up with like, this is why my essay is making a huge difference. And they still do. Uh, but the level of advantage that they're bringing to a business is, is going down. Right, and, and in part of that is because the system administrator should, is going away because you're not, there's, the systems are going away. Yeah. The systems are going to a hosted solution. You don't system admin it. You're just making, you know, you log into the account. The host has system administrators. Whoever you're buying your services from, <laughs> they've got a number of system administrators. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that would be, um, like you said, to, to that point, that's where the specialty positions you know, it's, it's focusing on that. So in the, in, yeah, the SMB, the system administration hack would be the better way to say it in the SMB, um, regardless of titles, because, well, anyways, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, the, the SMB hat for system administrator is really going away because there are going to be very few systems to administer in the SMB because it will be hosted. So you'll be administering the service. It's an account administrator. Account administrator at this point. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So and so there's 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 two aspects. One is the hat still exists. The systems administrator hat is being handed from small businesses to service providers, right? So that's that's part of the commodity of the line talk is really the hat mobility. Um, but what's uh, also happening. Um, and this is also a good thing, is that in the service provider space, because of standardization, because of modernization, because of automation, the number of people who need to wear the systems administrator, the systems administrator hat is decreasing. It's becoming more of a specialty, so to get into it is more and more you really need to know. It's not like, oh, I do a little bit on the side, it's part of, no, these people are, this is, they live and breathe it and they're very specialized. Um, and so even when I was on Wall Street, like we would have, General numbers were like a Windows systems administrator is normally considered to cap out around 30 servers is what they can manage in a production environment. Anything beyond that, and you just have too many things to do that you wouldn't be able to be available when you were needed, right? It wasn't that you couldn't manage more, you couldn't manage more in production, right? Because the, just the latency of like, well, I'm dealing with this fire, and now there's another fire, what do you want me to do? They don't want that to happen. So 30 was about where they, where they had people cap out. And on the Linux side, it was closer to 300, but they would have the same considerations that if you're managing 300 systems, you probably can't manage any more without not being available when we need you for something else. Those things are changing numerically. You still need those roles, you still need that specialty, you still need the skills, but the number of machines that we can administer now in a Snowflake environment has gone up dramatically, Snowflake being the traditional model where they are unique systems. Uh, you may be looking at a few hundred Windows machines, you may be looking at a few thousand Linux machines um, for, for really well automated systems and if you're getting away from snowflake environments you could easily be managing tens or even hundreds of thousands of servers but very few places have that much scale uh, but if you are talking about an aws you are talking about a uh, office 365 actually not azure right because azure still has lots of snowflakes hidden in it but when you're actually looking at the office 365 portion of azure that is easily more than a hundred thousand systems that are not snowflakes they may have three systems administrators on those, right? I bet they have more, but they don't necessarily need them. They could, they could have really big numbers. So in some ways, the number of systems administrators needed across the field is reducing, 
but it's also important to remember that the number of systems in the field is dramatically increasing. So the rate at which the number of people who need to do it is decreasing is not nearly as fast as it would seem because the number of systems that they have to take care of is going up so quickly because of the same moves, the move to cloud, the move to hosted, those places, you know, we had one server in house. This is say 2002. We got one big server, everything's on it. I got a systems administrator working on it. I've now moved that to hosted providers and I'm now using 15 servers, same people, same workloads, way more systems, but I have more efficient systems administrators. So the numbers have, have changed in interesting ways and will continue to. Yeah. So if someone is a systems administrator, um, you know, they need to wear their customer service hat, of course, they can specialize as you said. So if you're one of those people who has those options, what are some next possible career options for you as like adjacencies that you generally can see? Like if, if I don't want to generalize in that way, what kind of stuff if you, can If I you go don't into? want to be a generalist. Yes. Okay. Um, well, so the obvious ones are straight up systems administration is a very viable career field, right? The big companies, the, the Amazons, the, the Microsofts, they need lots of them as do the Fortune 100. Even you right. know, your Liberty Mutuals, your, your right. big insurance companies, they all need real system administrators in their data centers. Yeah, because sure. they're still using internal resources, they're still looking for competitive advantage. That's one of the biggest pieces. Systems administrators are common in shops that are looking at technology as significant competitive advantage. Right, so they're trying, so the, 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 the Wall Street firms are trying to, and I guarantee successfully, outperforming the cloud firms in how many, because they're able to specialize, they're not forced to be as general, so they leverage that at their scale to match more or less the scale that the big debt, because uh, once you get to the, so here's something that people need to understand about how scale works. There's a limit to how much scale can be an advantage to you, and all of the big firms go past it. There is a threshold, and that threshold is how many systems you can put into a data center, because you can't make the data centers bigger, right? You could, but then they would become ridiculous, right? An airplane crashed, it hit our data center, we lost the equivalent of 10 normal data centers. Oh my gosh, that was a bad idea, right? There's, a, there's an amount, it's just like with, uh, with the virtualization companies, right? If you go call VMware and say, what's the biggest system I could build? They will tell you, don't ask that question. Because no matter what the answer is, it's larger than you should build, right? Like it just doesn't matter, VMware or KVM or Hyper-V, anybody, they can build clusters larger than it is sensible to build as a single cluster, right? At some point you need another cluster. And um, you know, one of the, Starwind, right, provides the vSAN that will go as large as VMware or Hyper-V can cluster. So that gets you, I don't even know what the numbers are now, I know 255 nodes is an older number, and that's just, and that's just an enforced limit. Who, who even knows what the actual limits are, right? These are just the things that they tell you is a limit because it's ridiculous. And, and Starwind is like, well, yeah, we go to 255. Nobody should practically go over somewhere around 20 or 30. You, you know, somewhere, it's a soft limit. You could argue for exactly what your needs are, and if you came up with 40 as being a really practical number, they'd be like, okay, 40 we'll talk about. It, but it, It's kind of like chaining USBs. Yeah, you can chain 120 of them together, and you think it's gonna work? Right. And... The practical limit is more like three. Yeah. Right, so, so, so data centers have the same thing, that a data center can only get so large before the risk pool of a single data center becomes ridiculous, just as the risk pool of a single cluster becomes, there's just too much riding on a single building. Um, right. And Rackspace experienced this, right? They built one of the largest data centers and had a semi, it's known as the Rackspace disaster, right? The most crazy thing in the world, semi comes off the highway, careens into a power supply, blows out their power supply by going through the generator, right? It's okay, everything's redundant, the Rackspace, they know what they're doing, right? Everything's fine. They didn't miss a beat until the same careening semi bouncing off their one generator flew through the air or whatever and went through the other generator. So they didn't just cut out the power supplies from the outside world, they cut out the generators that they were going through. So they lost both electrical feeds, both generators that they should have picked up. And of course the UPSs kept things coming along for several minutes. Right, but that's all they got, right? And so they lost one of the world's largest and most critical data centers all in a single event that was never accounted for because nobody thought this could really realistically happen, right? 
But the problem was it was one data center that was just too big. Whereas like Microsoft's had Azure data center outages, Amazon has had AWS right. outages, and you know what? Yeah, we notice. People are like, oh my gosh, world's on fire. Netflix is down for a region, whatever. But the actual impact isn't that big because their data centers aren't as large and they have more rapid failover and, and that kind of it's stuff. only whatever if your kids are not currently watching the region that's down. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, oh my God, the world is on fire. Yes, <laughs> yes. But so that stuff, that stuff really impacts the systems administration space because systems administrators are still needed because we can't really scale certain things today past a certain reasonable size. And it's a, mm. it's a flexible number, but it's... There's other areas in which you can specialize in, in IT. You can be an ERP specialist. You right. can be a VoIP specialist. You can be uh, uh, an email specialist, an email administrator. Um, you know, there, are, there are those types of paths that you can right. take. And what I would say for that is what, you know, because your question was, what do I do? You know, you're an IT generalist because you're in small business or, or a medium business and you're, in, and you're one of several generalists that run the company. So what do I do? Well, first of all, what do you like to do? You know, I didn't become a VoIP specialist out of nowhere. All right, you know, I started, honestly, I started running a D&D game online in 1999. And I, it's like, hey, it's cool, text chat, but I want voice. So how can I solve this? And so I, I got into how can I do voice over IP without even knowing what the hell I was talking about at the time, all right? And yeah, and then I, I found solutions, set up my own servers, created a, a VoIP session to run my D&D game. Um, and then it's like, hey, this is easy. And then oh my, you know, and then suddenly here comes the job where, man, these calls and you got places in Mexico and all this. Like, I could just do that thing I did for my game and interface it with your old Avaya system and company still runs on that stuff, you know, to, for all their calls. Um, so how, you know, find something that you enjoy, I mean, that, that's something general IT career advice, advice. But, you know, but now in the perspective of our contact, uh, conversation here, think about something that you enjoy that you can think you might want to actually specialize in going forward, okay? So, you know, if you're Paul's age, you, know, you got less to worry about. You know, your, your retirement will hit because he's a baby boomer. I'm old. You know, but you know, if you're a Gen Xer. Ask or, Dominica, she'll tell you. <laughs> you know, but if you're a Gen Xer or something like that, and you've got, you've got 20, 30 years of, of standard career left in front of you or more, um, then yeah, you're going to want to look at um, finding something to do. Well, find some, like any other thing in IT, find what you like. Okay, I like IT, that's why I'm in, that's why I became a generalist, you know. Um, but hey, the world changes, you can't stay in the same place. You know, as, as was mentioned in the earlier, some of the earlier conversation, you know, I got hired by a company in 2007, um, replacing a guy that had been there for 11 years. The guy that was there for 11 years was still doing things the same way he did them 11 years ago. He, went, he was leaving for better opportunity um, I, he got fired from the new place because he didn't know anything. I, I learned that a year later. Um, yes. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a shock. It's you have to grow, you have to change, and anybody who's been in IT currently should know that. If you don't, wake up, it's a fact. Um, so look at all those things you're learning. Look around you. You know, you know, people will say, chase the dollar signs and go after a security and all that kind of stuff. It is a big deal, but um, the best security people are actually IT generalists. And if you don't believe me, go get in the community and talk to IRJ um, in, in the, on the ML community. His, uh, he was an IT generalist, decided to start getting certificates and certifications and specializing his way in. And now he's suddenly job, he's job hopped a couple of years ago to a new position because he had better choices. And now he was like, you know, my company's not doing so hot anymore. I want to start looking for somewhere else. And he was getting offers across the United States. He ended up staying fairly regional. I believe he did select that job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but he's taken a significant pay increase, much better responsibilities, and he loves the part of the work he's doing. Okay? 
ended up switching to that job was his excuse why he couldn't make it here because he just switched like yeah, that. Yeah, because he just changed jobs. <laughs> but, <laughs> I um, negotiated that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that. But, exactly. yeah, he could have. But the point was, he liked the security thing, so he did that. And he didn't just do it because it was the money. It was because that's what he enjoyed. I can tell you, I'm not into that. It's not a factor that I will go into by choice. You know, maybe my, something will change in my life and I'll, you know, whatever. I was a software developer for years and I, in 1995, I swore I'd never be a software developer. Um, that changed in about 2002. It's like, and I was doing software development. Uh, because just things change, my skills and things I've learned change and I liked it and I enjoyed it and, I, and things move through that way. Uh, you, so the best thing you can do is look at all the skills, which your generalist means you have all of them to some level. Look at all the hats, decide the ones you like. Because no matter which one you pick, if you start to specialize and try to try to actually specialize in that, the positions are out there. The specialist positions are going to rates that people need them are just going to grow and grow and grow as these lines move forward. That's and right. so you're good. The job's going to be there if you get the, get it. And, and you don't have to pick one specialty. You can pick two or three. Right, and just increase your skill set. that's okay, that. yeah. You're still but a generalist. It's, it's absolutely true. Pick something you like. Um, don't pick something because of the money. Right. I mean, obviously... Maybe avoid something because of... Right. Yeah. This picks nothing, I should not do that. that oh, yeah. That's, right. That's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I probably could make a lot of money as a proctologist, but I really don't want to. Right. So, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, also to answer your question, another, so, you know, it's easy to talk about technical specialties, right, but there's also the business specialty, and that is within our field, we have um, more or less three places where you can work. You can work for the vendors, right, and that's one type of job, like the, the way that you work with customers, the type of work you do, tends to have certain aspects that are kind of similar when you just work for a vendor, right? They do vary, but they tend to be a certain way. And when you work for a direct shop where you are internal IT and you are staff, you tend to have certain things in common with other people who do that and they work a certain way. And the third is the service provider space, right? Which could be integrator, ITSP, MSP, but they're all more or less the same. And they have ways that they work um, that tend to, to be in a certain way. And you can look at those three and say, which of these is the style and the, the lifestyle, the work style, the, the career options that I would enjoy. And all of us have picked uh, the ITSP space because we like the technical specialties, we like the variety that comes with it, we like the, the challenges, and we're willing to put up with the problems, right? The, the really long hours, the really volatile work environments. Um, the unbelievable level of, of change management and, um, and customer service and customer service right yeah. yeah so those are but those are all balances that people just have to find so if you're coming from an SMB space and you're finding that the thing that one of the, the things that you mentioned right I may not want to be a customer service generalist the SMB space internal staff tends to lean towards customer service and special and generalist very strongly whereas the other two fields do not. And so that itself, if you like that role, may be an indicator that the SMB internal space is your wheelhouse. And if that's something you dislike, it may be an indicator that you have gone your, your the length of your path within that and you need to look at one of the others because, you know, MSPs and ITSPs, really a big thing that we do is we aggregate customers. And in, to some degree, it's that we may aggregate complete departments and say, well, we're just representing lots of customers, but we also aggregate specialties for those departments. So we may work with a customer and we only provide a single specialty or a handful of specialties, but it's our specialties that they're coming for because they already have the generalists or other specialties, right? Specialties that are more unique to them and they need the specialties that they just don't happen to need as much of, so they need to outsource it or whatever. The, 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 other, the other thing you can do is, is go industry specific. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to go down the manufacturing path, manufacturers are manufacturers and manufacturers. They do things the same way, uh, pretty much. Uh, they use the same technologies, um, pretty much. Uh, but they're very similar in, in business scope. And so going in there, you know, going into a manufacturer and being the IT support for a manufacturer is definitely a career path. 
You can do the same thing with the insurance industry or the banking industry or the veterinary industry. You can become a specialist in that industry as the IT pro for that industry and still remain that generalist at. Unfortunately, you're still going to have to have the customer service and you know the, the user management piece of that, the vendor management piece of that, because it's still you're still gonna have to deal with that. You're still gonna have ERP systems, you're still gonna have POS systems, you're still gonna have um, you know document management systems that you're not gonna have to manage. So you're still gonna have to have that vendor management role, which you're probably already doing today. All right. Next question. I think we're I think that's Are we it. done? I think oh, we're done. Oh, oh, you know, one more question. Um, most of like, I guess what we're um, managing now with the type of technology mm -hmm. is stuff that wasn't around 10 years ago. What do you think was going to be around 10 years ago that we're not doing now that you see as emerging technology that's going to be in the warehouse of IT management? So. You mean in the future, what's going to be what's going to be relegated to the dustbin? Or what's going, more like what's going to be our new thing? What's going to be our new VMware? Well, I think it really is going to be uh, managed services. You're, it really is going to be the expertise of managing vendor services. Uh, as those clouds, as those servers move to the cloud, as desktops move to the cloud, as more and more people go to mobile workforce, um, that's that's really what I see going away. And at the same time, coming in, what's going away is the the server management that infrastructure management and what's going to re replace that is the management of those services that are doing it you know because they're still going to go down you're still i mean azure goes down aws goes down and then what happens your phone rings says hey my email's not working okay so what are you doing you're getting on the phone and you're getting etas you're you're managing that vendor uh and i and that's really where i see the shift um so i feel like we're there now what's the What's that the next phase? Well, the next phase is that uh, I, I think AI. Oh, is, yeah, AI, AI is going to, to replace a lot of that. AI and quantum computing are going to change things so drastically that honestly, I couldn't yeah. guesstimate what we're going to be doing and how it's going to take shape aside from in the general principles of this thing still have to be worked on, still have to be managed. But like as for a specific factor, there's just simply. Yeah, it, you know, I think. I think a lot of it is that if we actually look back 10 years, while we've shifted a certain amount, we haven't really given up any technologies and everything we're using today, we actually had that. So my day to day has shifted in that, uh, you know, operating systems are easier to maintain, patches are faster to do, the network is, like, I don't spend as much time doing a lot of those tasks, so I do more of them. Um, but. I'm still using the same virtualization, I'm still using the same cloud, I'm still using the same operating systems, I'm still using the same applications. Um, my guess is that in the, in the next 10 years, especially given how slowly companies change, I don't anticipate that we're actually going to see that much change. We could be here in 10 years. I mean, think about a conference like this 10 years ago, right? I, so when I spoke at conferences like this 10 years ago, a lot of the things that we were talking about, sand and understanding storage, um, career talks that were very much like this. Half a decade ago, I gave the commodity line talk that I'm gonna give in a minute. Um, and those things really haven't changed that much. They do change, but it's the pace is not nearly as fast as it feels like, um, and it constantly slows. Now some things like quantum computing may come in, although it's very unlikely even in 10 years that we're gonna have it, we're like, we're accessing right. it, right? It's gonna be like, oh, we, now we understand how it's gonna be used in 10 years, 10 years from now, um, maybe, I mean, they may come up with manufacturing and get it really quick, but that's unlikely. Um, because of that, I think you're going to see in, in, within the next at least five years, 10 years really is a fair amount of time. Um, machines are going to become way more reliable. Speeds are going to keep getting better. So things like we're just encrypting everywhere because we can. It's just so, like, the overhead's gone away. It's no longer a discussion about encryption. We just encrypt everything. Security starts getting better. Uh, but it's all just incremental increases. Um, I do think that we are right now on the cusp of seeing a huge slide away from Windows on the desktop, um, both because Microsoft 
is very clearly preparing to leave the desktop space to some degree, right? Not that they're going to abandon Windows, but Microsoft is really, really clear that they do not see the desktop as their future. Um, and other players are really clear that they do see the desktop as their future. And for the first time in the last, I want to say, 18 months, I have personally seen, now this is very anecdotal, of course, uh, but after years and years and years of saying people should really look at alternatives, there's been a shift of, yeah, 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 everyone says that. And of course, they're theoretically possible to people asking me, why aren't we looking at alternatives? Right? Everybody's looking for alternatives because they're like, wow, Windows has gone downhill dramatically. Um, even though Windows is now essentially free, now it's not, you know, it used to be Windows is 150 bucks, done, right? Now it's Windows is free, why aren't they paying us? It's this bad, right? That's been the mindset change that I see from businesses, right? They're, they're really Absolutely. looking for alternatives. And, Absolutely. and Apple really came in hard and got Mac in there and got iOS in there. And people are like, oh, look, non Windows. And then Apple kind of, I don't even know where they went. They seem like they just disappeared for the most part. And it's like, well, that's interesting. And so they kind of broke through this barrier and then left an industry gap. And all of a sudden, whether it's traditional Linux or it's Android or it's Chrome OS, seem to be just kind of filling the gap really quickly. And, and I th in my opinion, the reason that that's changing is that you, people used to look at computers as they have to do everything. And what users are realizing is that they only use their computers for very specific things. Like, they use it for email. They use it for their ERP. They use it to get on the internet. They use it to make documents. And they make some spreadsheets. Once in a while, they may interface with a database and make play with access on their desktop. But that's really the exception. You might have one guy in the company that does that because he wants to do some crazy stuff. But generally, that's all they're doing with those devices. Right. So as soon as you can provide delivery methods under a different engine, they don't care. Do I still get my email? Yep. Does it still look pretty much the same? Yep. Can I still write a document? Yep. Can I, you know? Can I still make a spreadsheet? Yep. They really don't care. And what what's happened from that is that you don't need to have this heavy bloated OS that has you know everything from a calculator to a pinball machine. It just needs to be able to support these other things that I really need to do. I think um, you know something that came up in, in a conversation just in the last 48 hours, um, Dash Render was asking this, so if he's watching this, this is what prompted. Um, he was looking at his company, and we we're all, his comes up a lot. <laughs> he makes great examples for things. But so he's, he's always looking for how do we, the software that they have isn't that great, but how do you get it better because nobody cares? And I think this is a spot where we as an industry may actually change um, over the next 10 years, right? So it's because we kind of have this, uh, what's, the, what's the next frontier for us to bring value? And we talked about a whole bunch of them and specifically asking about the technologies that come and go kind of brings up that this is an entire space that we tend to not deal with today. And that is evaluating and pushing vendors to modernize. And this is a spot where as we get training, as we get time, our companies can begin to come to us more and more and say, because uh, I just did a few videos on this for Sam IT, um, should we evaluate bespoke software? And this is again, now this is anecdotal, but in the last two years, suddenly I'm having more and more companies come to me and say, let's have a bespoke software conversation. Right? Now they typically end up saying, wow, that was a great conversation. No, that's not what we're going to do. But Previously, it was never have that conversation. It would just not come up because dropping a half million dollars on software development. seemed development is expensive. Support. Right, you know? development is super expensive, and the moment that they realize you can't send it to India and get it done for five dollars an hour and have it done in three weeks, they go, oh, oh, I thought this was going to be like two thousand dollars to build a new operating system. No, it's not like that. But so, so you eliminate some with that. But then once you, you sit down and say, okay, but if you had half a million dollars and you were willing to wait this amount of time, we could start having conversations like building your own ERP or building an in, a completely internal workflow systems. Eddie came from a, an environment where they did this at 20 years ago. They sat down and said, we're going to build a bespoke software that is going to completely define our field. And they did. And they run 100% on it. And it's 
it's not like, oh, we, we have a little bit of a competitive advantage because we built the software. Their business depends on that bespoke software defining everything they do from how people clock in to how they get paid to how they interact between each other. It's their communications mechanism. It's their everything. Right. And that stuff is, is amazing, right? So if you have a business that can do that, or you have a business that can go after vendors and say, look, we're gonna consider bespoke, we're gonna consider your competitors, and we're gonna hold you accountable to making us software that does a good job. And I think that's where the vendors are changing and where we as IT can help push that forward because of things like social communities and our, and our conversations and the openness of things, like everything's more open. They know they can just go to the Amazon and see a price, like it was mentioned earlier. Well, the same thing happens with the vendors, all right? Your software sucks because I have to always install this print, stupid printer driver thing or whatever it was we had in a POS conversation in the thread, <laughs> the poor guy with the bad point of sale systems. Um, but those vendors are now just gonna start getting weeded out because day after day, one of the things we're going for, as we go forward, people are asking the community, and I just asked one again, I had the email software, and then I asked about a new point of sale software somebody recommended. Um, it's like, so I find out now about these things, and if your solution is horrible, what can you do to fix it? Or if your solution is horrible, I'm gonna leave you and go to another one, because there's more choices now. So, and, and again, it comes back into the management, and I think that's how things are gonna just speed up. People aren't gonna just simply buy Windows, or buy Microsoft SQL Server, or buy this software package to run their business and keep it forever, which is what has always happened, you know? You know, how long has your business ran on Pro Epicor Profit 21, okay? It's a horrible solution for a lot of companies, good solution for some companies, I won't argue that. But what about moving forward and switching? I, I've got that, I've got a client right now with Profit 21 that they're finally tired of it. And they're finally tired of the not doing what they want. So they want a new solution. And that could be bespoke software. It could be bespoke software, half a million you know, yeah. dollars to get produced, or it could be some other solution with some customizations or just a modern ERP company has the right solution. Mm -hmm. And that's, going forward is something that the IT staff are gonna be doing in the next five, 10 years because everything's more open. You, know, you ask where are we going, and, and you know, not with the hardware specifically, but just in general, everything's more open, everything's out there. You know, I pissed a vendor off in Mongolassi the other week. <laughs> I don't care, um, because it was a true question. And I actually changed the title thread after a conversation and realizing that it was simply a misunderstanding for part of it. Um, but I honestly didn't care about that, and I'm not gonna get rid of the thread. It's public information, and it was all factual as understood at the time. Nobody was lying or misconstruing anything. There was misunderstandings and the unclear things, and guess what? The vendor changed. The vendor fixed their process to not cause that misunderstanding for people in the future. Yep. And see, that's, that's important stuff. This shift that we've, you know, either you're, you've been going through it, you've already made this, or you're, you're seeing it come, to service-based IT, is it gives you leverage. It gives you leverage you didn't have before. Because when the email system didn't work, you were on the hook for it. Because it was yours, it was in-house, you managed it. And when it didn't work, the CEO was at your desk. Well, now you have leverage because you have a provider who's providing that. When it doesn't work, you get to go to them and say, hey, either you're gonna pay me or you're gonna fix it. And they do, and sometimes they do both. Like in the case of AT&T, not only did they fix it, but they paid you for it. So you know, that's that's where that shift can be advantageous. All right, we'll take a little break, and then uh, Scott's gonna talk about the line. Uh, my turn.